Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Sam Fenler, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host Burnett v. Smith and Implied Rights of Action. We're joined by Anya Bidwell and Aaron Holly. Mm -hmm. Anya Bidwell is an attorney with the Institute for Justice. There, she helps lead the Institute's project of immunity and accountability. Her work aims to promote judicial engagement and government accountability. Anya is an expert on the intersection between policing and the Constitution, and her writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, National Review, and other outlets. Erin Holly is Senior Counsel and Vice President of Center for Life and Regulatory Practice at Alliance Defending Freedom. Erin has wide experience in the law. She has worked in private practice, litigated extensively before the U.S. Supreme Court, served in the DOJ, and taught constitutional law at Mizzou. She is a former clerk to Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts and regularly provides legal commentary to a number of media outlets. If you'd like to learn more about today's speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that, as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federalist Society. With that, Anya, thank you very much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to Sam uh, and to FedSoc for hosting this discussion. Um, and thank you to Aaron for joining me. I'm uh, looking forward to delving into this very interesting topic uh, that gets to the fundamental question um, of what courts are supposed to do versus what legislators are supposed to do when it comes to providing damages for violations of constitutional rights. Um, it all starts from this big idea uh, that where there is a right, there must be a remedy because a right imposes a correlative duty to refrain from violating it. Um, as Alexander Hamilton wrote in The Federalist 15, uh, if there be no penalty annexed to disobedience, the resolution or commands which pretend to be laws will in fact amount to nothing more than advice or recommendation. The question then becomes, what does an individual need to do to obtain this remedy when his right was violated? Uh, if the right is violated by a private party, um, then this individual can go to court and sue in tort. Uh, for example, if a neighbor comes into my home steals my guns and destroys them, I can go to a court of general jurisdiction, state court, um, and sue him for trespass on chattel or conversion. Uh, but what if it was a state law enforcement officer who came to my home and seized my lawfully possessed firearms and later destroyed them? Um, again, I can go to a state court and sue this officer for trespass on chattel. Um, a more interesting question is whether I can also sue this officer for violating my rights under a state constitution uh, to keep and bear arms. Um, or how about a case with no tort analog? Uh, what if this law enforcement officer comes into my home uh, in response to a noise complaint, uh, catches me praying and orders me to stop? Uh, can I ask a court to order a remedy for violating my religious liberty? Um, that's where the separation of powers question comes in. Uh, some state courts uh, like the Supreme Court in Iowa with its case Burnett and West Virginia are saying that individuals can't sue directly under state constitutions uh, unless there is an explicit authorization within that constitutional provision to sue for damages or unless a state legislative body specifically authorizes such a lawsuit by passing a, stat a statute providing for a cause of action. Uh, so for example, the Michigan constitution says, every person shall be at liberty to worship God according to the dictates of his own 
conscience. Um, so that's not enough. Right. By the Iowa Supreme Court's logic, in order to be enforceable, Michigan legislature needs to pass a statute saying that there is a cause of action to sue for violations of religious rights or the text of the Constitution needs to be amended to add that an official who violates the freedom of worship is liable through an action for damages. Um, other state courts like Michigan. Nevada, Montana, to name just a few, uh, they're about 16 or 17. Uh, they are saying that providing a remedy under a state constitution is inherently a province of the courts. Uh, they say that since the founding and even before then, people could get damages for violations of their individual rights. It shouldn't matter that instead of suing in tort, you're suing under a state constitution. Uh, state courts still have the common law power to order remedies for violations of rights, and they can use that power with respect to both common law torts and constitutional torts. Um, in these states, constitutional authorization language works the other way. If ratifiers do not think that courts should be providing a damages remedy, then they must specifically say so. And they do. Uh, here's Michigan's uh, Article 1, Section 2, or at least a part of it. It says, no person shall be denied the equal protection of the laws. And then it says, the legislature shall implement this section by appropriate legislation. Those are the key words. And they make it clear that the ratifiers intended for the judiciary to wait for a congressional authorization. Um, so what is driving this disagreement between the states? Um, as is often the case, um, United States Supreme Court is difficult to ignore. Um, even when its decisions are not exactly on point, state courts pay attention. In this case, there is a line of Supreme Court case law starting with Bivens versus six unnamed agents of the Bureau of Narcotics which deals with a related issue, suing federal officials in federal courts for violations of federal constitutional rights. Um, the US Supreme Court in Bivens said that federal courts have the power to order a damages remedy for violations of the Fourth Amendment. It then extended this holding to the Fifth and Eighth Amendments and then had a change of heart um, culminating with a 2022 decision in Egbert versus Boulay, where the court essentially said no more. Federal judiciary does not have the power to order damages unless Congress specifically says so, save for a very narrow set of circumstances. At the heart of this Bivens rebellion uh, is the belief by the Supreme Court, uh, starting really with Chief Justice Rehnquist and then Justice Scalia, uh, that federal courts were getting ahead of themselves. That by assuming that they can recognize remedies without congressional authorization, they were assuming state courts common law powers. As Justice Rehnquist wrote in his Carlson versus Green dissent, by recognizing damages under the Constitution, federal courts were acting like general courts of common law without having the authority to do so. Federal courts have limited jurisdiction, Rehnquist says. The powers of general government are made up from concessions by states. Congress intended to leave damages in Bivens actions to state courts. So our limited jurisdiction is better used elsewhere. That's the main reasoning in those cases. And to that point, Michigan, Nevada, Montana, they agree with Rehnquist and Scalia. They say, but we are general courts of common law and we do have the power to order remedies, including damages remedies when rights are violated. Um, they say it doesn't matter whether we do it under common law or under state constitutions. Our role since the founding has been to enforce the law by ordering remedies 
and we are acting consistent with that power. So while Bivens may be a disfavored precedent, we are fundamentally different from federal courts and don't have the same concerns. Courts like the Iowa Supreme Court, they dismiss the difference between state and federal courts. Um, to them, separation of powers is separation of powers, uh, whether on the federal or state level. So if the text of the statute or the constitution does not explicitly provide for a damages remedy, then courts don't have the power to enforce it. To these courts, Bivens being disfavored is evidence that they are right. Um, I come down on the side of Michigan, Montana, and Nevada. Um, Justices Rehnquist and Scalia won the argument in federal courts because they said federal courts are not state courts. Federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction and their limited resources should be spent elsewhere. These courts are also deriving their power from Congress to a much greater extent than common law courts are deriving their powers from state legislatures. As Chief Justice Rehnquist said, uh, Congress has broad authority to establish priorities for the allocation of judicial resources in defining the jurisdiction of federal courts. That's simply not true with state courts. If the limited role of the federal judiciary is the argument, then it is not clear how we can now turn around and say that common law courts also don't have the same power to enforce remedies under state constitutions. True, constitutional claims are different from common law claims, but just like common law claims, the underlying source are not legislators. The underlying source are the people and their intent to protect individual rights from the will of the majorities. In this situation, the default option, just like in Michigan, should be courts, not majoritarian institutions, ordering languages, not majoritarian institutions like legislatures. And if people wanted lawmakers to craft remedies, then they should have explicitly said so in the text. Um, to be consistent with Egbert and with all the dissents that eventually became majorities in Bivens jurisprudence, um, we should let common law courts do what they have done since before the founding, give meaning to rights by enforcing remedies. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Anya. Um, we agree about a lot um, and have a, a few areas uh, of disagreement um, as well. And one thing that Anya picked up on, and I think is really important for framing our discussion, is just the difference between federal courts and state courts, and to what uh, extent that difference persists. Um, and there may be different answers in different courts um, in, among different states, I should say. So to sort of set the, the playing field, um, as Anya did, in the federal courts, and I'd be curious as to whether she agrees with them, I think she might not. <laughs> um, but but the, the Supreme Court has been pretty clear um, that it's no longer in the business of creating private causes of action for constitutional violations. Um, instead, as Anya said, what uh, the courts do is they look to Section 1983 or a different statutory provision in order to remedy those constitutional violations. Um, and if you not now. Why not? Uh, <laughs> So, sorry, guys. Um, so we had swimming, but it's too cold. <laughs> um, so when you are thinking about, um, you know, whether a private right of action can arise from a constitutional provision without congressional authorization, the real question, as Justice, I believe it was Thomas, put it in Egbert, uh, 
Um, is that the most important question is who should decide whether a damage remedy should be provided? Uh, is it Congress or the courts? And so I think in this entire field of law, as in many fields of law, administrative law or others, the question is who decides? Is it Congress or the courts? Um, and what um, does the Constitution say about that allocation? What do the state constitution say about that allocation? And what does it mean as a policy matter? So to take... So, so sorry again, guys. Um, oh so he is holding me hostage um, by asking for a TV show if, if I will agree as, as he knows that I'm uh, <laughs> doing work. <laughs> so he's a, a future lawyer, perhaps. Um, I'm sure. So, yes, yes. But as, as we are considering this question uh, of who decides, um, when you think about the way the federal government is structured, we do have these clear separation of powers boundaries. Um, and those boundaries, um, as Madison and others put it, are really liberty affirming. And the reason they're liberty affirming is that it takes every branch of government acting in concert before an individual's liberty can be curtailed. Uh, so the idea is that, you know, the legislature has to enact a statute, uh, the executive has to enforce it, and then the courts also have to uh, find liability uh, before someone's uh, liberty or personal liberty uh, can be infringed. So I'm really a proponent, a fan of separation of powers, because I do believe that they are liberty enhancing. Um, they are a way for the courts to put a check on the executive branch um, or the administrative state. Um, and sort of the flip side, um, Sam, are we having technical difficulties? These. Um, the idea is that uh, courts are in a less uh, positioned, they're, they're not as well positioned to consider all of the policy implications uh, as is Congress. Um, in Egbert, uh, for example, uh, the court says uh, creating a cause of action is a legislative endeavor. Um, they have to consider a range of policy considerations. Um, and then that's not typically what we think of as within the province of courts. Now, Anya is exactly correct that we have a different sort of set of background rules when we are talking about federal courts and state courts. Uh, so in the state courts, the question is, you know, do the same separation of principles, separation of powers principles apply? Um, and I think the question to that is maybe. Um, I think you look um, at the state constitution, the state separation of powers, and it seems like the Iowa Supreme Court has a lot going for it when they recognize uh, the problems with judicially created remedies, uh, the same problems that would inherit um, in a federal system uh, that's creating these causes uh, of action. Um, in fact, as Anya was talking, I just looked up a quick law review article. Um, it's by Justice Scalia. Um, it talks very much about this common law courts in a civil law system, uh, the role of federal courts in interpreting the Constitution and laws. And what Justice Scalia talks about is very much this discussion. And he notes that when you go to law school, you are trained in the law of torts and you're trained in the law of contracts. And, and these are all state law causes of action uh, in which there's this body of common law uh, that develops um, and is changes um, with the cases uh, as, as judges make these decisions. Uh, he contrasts that uh, with federal law. Um, and he says, you know, sort of the problem with this common law narrative um, is a little word uh, known as democracy. Um, and we like, uh, in the federal court system at least, uh, the legislative power to reside in legislative hands. Uh, so it seems as a matter of first principles, a good policy idea to separate uh, the legislative power from the judicial power. Um, and in that uh, way, allow the democratic process to be involved in determining what remedies uh, are in fact appropriate. Uh, another thing I'd point out um, as something that I, that I know Anya is aware of is the fact that state constitutions are very unlike the federal constitution. Um, they actually resemble statutes um, much more than the constitutional law. They change all the time. They're voluminous. So it is not as arduous a task to amend a state constitution uh, as it would be a, a federal constitution. So, so you don't have 
uh, the kind of um, uh, logistical problems uh, in getting uh, an amendment that you might have at the federal level. So I think that also cancels in favor of uh, leaving more to the legislative process. But I will admit, um, and I think Anya's right on this, that in a system of common law, then the states do have, state court systems do have a larger prerogative um, under which to think about what sorts of rights might be appropriate uh, for causes of action. Yeah, I have a couple of points uh, to respond to. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, federal um, officers' accountability under federal constitution. Um, and um, what my opinion is with regards to that, and you and I had a discussion on Egbert versus Boulay with Judge Strauss, um, uh, what uh, my view there is that there actually is congressional authorization, right? And it's in the Westfall Act. So the Westfall Act is an amendment to the FTCA. And in 1988, Congress basically said, you know, you can no longer sue federal officials in state courts. Um, um, we basically, as the federal government, can essentially will essentially come in and assume responsibility for tort-like causes of action. But it also said when it comes to violations of constitutional rights, then you can still proceed with lawsuits against individual defendants. So uh, that clause within uh, the, within the Westfall Act, that constitutional exception, is congressional authorization to be able to sue federal officials for federal constitutional violations. Um, and uh, just, uh, Justice Alito um, in uh, Hernandez versus Mesa uh, specifically said that, well, Congress left the Westfall Act where it found it in 1988. And so we agree with that, but what, what, what I'm saying is that in 1988, when Congress passed the Westfall Act, that uh, Bivens' cause of action was still robustly enforced. So it, as it stands in 1988, Congress did endorse the federal constitutional uh, cause of action. And also definitely agree that there is this big idea that uh, since the founding, uh, individuals could sue federal officials for violations of individual rights. They sued in common law torts, then federal officials would invoke the defense of um, acting uh, you know, constitutionally, and then you would have a rebuttal that they violated the constitution. So that's kind of a natural progression to uh, uh, what we have today as the Bivens regime. But um, that's kind of put to the side. Um, I think that the, 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 the main argument here is as Justice Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice Scalia, and then Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch mentioned, you know, uh, there is a big difference between federal courts um, and state courts. And state courts, they are common law courts. They have traditionally had powers to uh, order remedies. And from that perspective, I find it very persuasive uh, what Michigan Supreme Court says in the Basserman decision, when it basically says, you know, uh, it's a traditional role of courts to order remedies. So when ratifiers write the constitution and then people pass this constitution, they assume in the background that it will be courts common law courts that will be ordering remedies. So unless uh, ratifiers specifically say, like they do in that equal protection clause on the Michigan constitution, um, uh, specifically say that, you know, the legislature shall implement this section by appropriate legislation. If there is that language, then great, courts should back off because the people intended for legislature to come up with a cause of action. But if there isn't that language, then it's fair to presume that because these are common law courts, they will be the ones stepping in and fashioning remedies for violations of um, constitutional rights. Um, as to the point about um, the separation of powers and, and, and what's liberty enhancing and what's not liberty enhancing, I also find it uh, persuasive, this idea of, you know, what we're talking about is the Bill of Rights, right? State Bill of Rights versus Federal Bill of Rights. And um, 
bills of rights are uh, uh, naturally, uh, you know, anti-majoritarian documents, right? Where you're basically saying, I have a right to bear arms and majority can't just come in and say that I don't have that right, right? That the legislature can just come in and write a law saying that I don't have that right. I have that right and it pre-exists whatever the legislature wants to do. So that's why I, I think it's counterintuitive then to say, oh, you know, even though this is an anti-majoritarian bill of rights, these are majoritarian institutions like legislatures that should be coming in and writing cause of actions, authorizing me to vindicate those rights that are supposed to be protected from the wills of the majority. So, um, and uh, I agree that that argument is much stronger when it comes to state courts. And, uh, but I also agree, like you're saying, Erin, that it is, state constitutions are different. There are 50 different state constitutions and they have slightly different arrangements. But we can't forget that fundamentally at the end of the day, state courts are common law courts of general jurisdiction that even before America became America in England already had powers to fashion those remedies. So uh, from that perspective, I think courts in Michigan, in Nevada, in Montana, they stand on a very, very firm ground when they say that we can order remedies for violations of the constitutional rights. And it's 100% consistent with opinions like Egbert versus Boulay, because there uh, the court very much is concerned with federal courts not being um, courts of general jurisdiction being very limited by what they can do. And uh, as Justice Scalia famously said, you know, you know, we're not in the heady days of assuming common law powers. But, uh, you know, I think that, that state courts uh, can be in those heady days because they have those powers. So, so I think that I think that could be correct. I think in that same Law Review article, Justice Scalia points out that as a whole, certainly in the federal courts, but in the state courts as well, we're moving more to a statutory based system where more and more of our laws are codified rather than coming up, percolating up through the common law courts. And you certainly still have areas like torts and contracts, the, the sort of areas that, that will hope Hopefully, I, I kind of like the common law. Hopefully, I'll always be sort of the, the common law domain. But I do wonder, and I don't know about the answer to this, but but I wonder if the assumption that the federal courts are, or excuse me, that state courts are the ones that are going to be fashioning the remedies, I wonder if that assumption is still true today. Um, it, it could be, I, and I agree with certainly. Uh, if, if so, then that would be a sort of factor on the scales of putting the presumption the way um, Anya suggests. So, so I think the question is, you know, where does the presumption lie? Is there a presumption in favor of courts being able to craft these remedies to constitutional violations? Um, and does Congress have to do something explicit? Uh, do, do the state uh, congressional houses have to do something explicit? Um, or does the presumption go the other way as in the federal court system uh, under Egbert where we presume federal courts don't have the power and authority to invent these remedies um, and that it's Congress's role. So, so, so I think that's, uh, you know, sort of where we're at. And, and I think it, it actually makes a lot of sense for both federalism principles as well as um, separation of powers principles that, that maybe it's okay that we have state courts coming to different conclusions on this question. I don't know, do, do you think that's possible, Anya, that, that maybe maybe both of the state courts are, are right under, under their view of uh, sort of how their state government is structured? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, so I think that fundamentally, um, state courts, right, since the beginning of this country, so the most consistent uh, originalism theory, right, is that state courts were supposed to be common law courts that were fashioning remedies, right? And that's kind of like 
the assumption under which the Republic started. And the examples that they had were the common law courts of England. So that's like to be consistent with the history of the country and with the breakdown of powers when the country was started, those common law courts should still be able to um, uh, fashion those remedies and legislators, frankly, can't not uh, stop common law courts from being common law courts. That would be inconsistent with the founding idea. Um, but but I do think that the court in uh, uh, Burnett makes this interesting argument when they talk about, um, you know, um, uh, that language that they have in their constitution, right? And it says, <laughs> Uh, the General Assembly shall pass all laws necessary to carry this constitution into effect. Um, so that language, I, I think the previous case, Godfrey, addresses it effectively uh, because Iowa actually had like a back-to-back -back de de decisions essentially, right? In Godfrey, they first say, we have a right to recognize remedies under the constitution and then the judge, Judge Mansfield, who writes the dissent in that opinion, writes the majority with the new court in Iowa in this Burnett decision, right? I do feel like, uh, I do think that the Godfrey court addresses that particular clause effectively, where they say, you know, the General Assembly shall pass all laws necessary to carry this constitution into effect means that it's essentially a transitional language from going from pre-1857 constitution to post-1857 constitution, that it actually didn't affect the fundamental breakdown of powers. It was just, you know, legislature, we changed the constitutions, and you now need to have all these procedural things in place to make sure that it works. Um, and uh, the Institute for Justice has this um, database called 50 Shades of Government Accountability. Hard to forget. <laughs> so I recommend everybody um, who is interested in that go uh, and look at this database. We break down all the state's constitutions and look at different languages. And it, this kind of language really is an aberration, which makes me think that the Godfrey opinion was right about it, that it was very much talking about this transitional nature between the uh, uh, going from one constitution to another, rather than this general role of legislatures recognizing uh, causes of action. So I think generally speaking, uh, uh, state, con uh, state constitutions are pretty consistent in terms of um, not infringing upon the common law uh, duties of, um, uh, of state courts. Yeah, and I think that that brings up something interesting. Um, I taught a state constitutional law class last year um, at Regent, um, and one of we we used some of Judge Sutton's books. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance uh, to review them, but uh, you would love them. That they're fantastic. Um, but Judge Sutton makes the the really powerful point that there is often, not always, but often a sort of knee jerk reflexive idea that the state courts should follow the federal courts and especially the Supreme Court in the interpretation of constitutional law. Um, but of course, um, there are two separate layers of constitutional law. Um, there's both uh, the state constitution, which can be more protective of rights, not less, but but can be much more protective of rights, which which I think everyone agrees, or at least on this call, is, is a good thing. Um, and, um, you know, the, the federal constitution sets the floor, uh, states can go above and beyond that as they, as they have in a number of areas. Um, but Judge Sutton points out a number of cases in which um, state courts, you know, did sort of take on this role of interpreting their own constitutions um, with, with really good results. And then other cases in which, you know, maybe it was more of a reflexive, you know, this is what the federal constitution says. So we're going to interpret our own uh, state constitution similarly. So, so it seems like to me, there could be two things going on in the Iowa opinion. Um, you could have uh, on the one hand, sort of this, this, um, recognition um, of, of federal law that kind of seeps into uh, state law. Um, or on the other hand, um, as the opinion points out, you could have 
this recognition that that maybe what Iowa did in changing its constitution was really separate and different um, and does distinguish uh, Iowa from uh, common law courts uh, of yesteryear. So, so I think that's maybe two ways of looking at, at the Iowa decision. Um, and I don't think any of us knows exactly which is one uh, you know, it comes uh, closest to to what's going on there. But but I think that there is, um, if nothing else, I think this webinar is powerful for illustrating the differences between state and federal court, um, and in many ways how those differences are also liberty affirming. Um, if you are presenting a, a constitutional claim, um, you really want to bo raise both your state constitution uh, and uh, the federal constitution, and it could be that you win um, on the state constitutional claim. So, so I think that that's a sort of a backdrop that that's really important here, um, and and buttresses. Anya's point about, you know, what, what states have historically done under common law. Yeah, and it's such a fascinating point about um, kind of how uh, state courts react to what the federal Supreme Court is saying, right? Mm -hmm. Even in regards to its own domain. Um, yeah. And that's why I think these three cases are particularly fascinating. The mm -hmm. Burnett case uh, from mm -hmm. Iowa, and then you have Mack from Nevada and you have Bosserman from Michigan because the three of those cases came out after Egbert versus Boulay, right? Where the Supreme Court basically said, you know, we are very, very, very skeptical of uh, implying causes of uh, action under the United States Constitution. And, and, and so those three courts, and Egbert is clearly, you know, uh, in the background as they're thinking about this. And they're kind of trying to um, figure out what their role is. And especially, you know, uh, Justice Thomas's strong words about like the separation of powers and where the federal courts fits within that framework that, you know, uh, you have Iowa, you have M Michigan and Nevada all grasp grappling with this idea about what is our role within our separation of powers? And does the fact that we are common law courts change that calculus? Um, yeah, it is fascinating. There is essentially a split that you can't really take up to the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> yes. uh, but there is a post-Egbert split on uh, implied rights of action, uh, or, you know, probably that's an unfavorable term in that sense, like <laughs> recognizing remedies under constitution, under state constitutions, as opposed to uh, the federal constitution. And we'll see many more states will have an opportunity uh, to, um, uh, uh, you know, answer that question. <laughs> well, wonderful. Thank you both. You've been you've been great. You're making my job very easy. But we will open the floor now to audience uh, questions. So again, if you do have a question, please enter it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. We should have plenty of time to get through many of them. I want to start with a question. Um, after hearing both of you speak about this, I want to ask about the logistics of creating remedies, kind of the nuts and bolts here. And I want to focus first on the state level, because I think that's less controversial on federalism and separation of powers grounds. But at the state level, I'm curious what each of you think uh, is the best branch or which branch of government is best suited to create these remedies. Um, is it the legislature or is it um, the judicial branch? Because one thing that sticks out to me is, um, even though both of you noted that state constitutions are more voluminous, um, perhaps there's more to draw on there, I wonder if the legislature is simply limited by not being able to see um, or foresee every possible um, incident that may happen um, and therefore create something, codify something to give citizens a right of action. Um, Anya, if we can start with you if, um, if you're okay with tackling that one. Sure, sure. Um, uh, so I think that 
calling it creating remedies kind of puts me at a disadvantage, right? Because then it kind of really assumes that we are doing some sort of a, almost like a policy making exercise, right? And courts are not supposed to engage in policy. So what I would say not, instead of creating remedies, I'd rather say recognizing remedies, right? And this fundamental idea that we all know from Marbury versus Madison, right? That where there is a right, there must be a remedy. So that like what uh, Hamilton said, right? In the Federalist 15, that if there is no penalty, um, then essentially uh, the, the laws are nothing other than advice or recommendation. So if we are talking about remedies as essentially the other side of the right, right? As something that's necessary pegged to the right. Then we're not creating them, we are recognizing them. And there really are two big buckets of remedies. One remedy is damages, and another remedy is injunctions, prospective relief. And what's interesting is that uh, when it comes to federal courts, especially that that federal courts have no problem um, recognizing injunctive remedies against um, government officials, even though injunctive relief is much more disruptive, right? Like there is a lawsuit right now uh, in Montana, uh, you know, they're, they're suing Montana government for, you know, uh, uh, essentially allowing oil companies to drill and basically saying that these are violating our rights to uh, clean environment, right? And they are asking for an injunction, right? They're not asking for damages. And think if, if the court actually sides with the plaintiffs here, it's going to be an injunction that would be much more, um, you know, involved than than what damages would be, which is like pay uh, for the damage that you caused me. Um, so damages are a traditional relief. They're very much, you know, if you look at the founding, very much of a default relief. Um, and what is also interesting is that in many cases, they are the only relief available uh, because, for example, with the excessive force case, uh, if, uh, you know, a Bureau of Land Management law enforcement officer uh, beats you up, you, you can't sue him in the future to not do that to you again. You, you wouldn't have standing to do that, but you can actually sue for damages, for retrospective relief, for what he did to you in the past. So really you don't have, to, it's not complicated when it comes to recognizing uh, rights for violations of constitutional rights that we're talking about, the, the Bill of Rights rights, right? Uh, damages are very much a, the least disruptive uh, remedy and the most uh, traditional remedy. Um, and uh, the courts are not engaging in some sort of policy making when they are recognizing that. And, and you know, Michigan uh, Supreme Court is very good at kind of laying out uh, uh, the thought process behind it. Uh, now, uh, you write, though, I think, uh, to, to, to zoom in on what the United States Supreme Court is concerned. And and uh, the court spends a lot of time in its opinions like Egbert and Hernandez and Ziegler, where it's basically saying, you know, the, the, the federal government is complicated. Uh, there are a lot of things that are going on. And if we are, you know, coming in, especially if it's like a national security context, and we're coming in and we're getting involved where there's already some sort of an alternative framework. We really don't want to be disrupting that very complicated uh, uh, administrative uh, uh, procedure that they all fashioned. So, so there um, again, it, it's it's uh, it's an easier argument for why remedy shouldn't be created, I suppose. Uh, but when you're just talking about common law tort or frankly, constitutional tort, um, 
where it involves excessive force or, you know, uh, uh, like that case, actually, that was from a real case where the woman was praying and the law enforcement officer went in and stopped her from doing that, right? When you're talking about those kind of uh, straight up Bill of Rights violations, then remedies against individuals, remedies are not complicated. Remedies are just uh, default damages for your rights being violated. Aaron, what do you think? So, so I agree with a lot of that from a policy perspective. I think sort of the the slight pushback may be that there's not much to constrain common law courts from going outside those traditional remedies. So, if we are in a you know true common law system where the common law uh, judge is able to fashion remedies to remediate a right violation, then that does open up in some ways, I think, a plethora of different remedial options. Um, so, so I think it's certainly true that judges have more than damages at their disposal. I, I think Anya's correct that, you know, the default would probably be damages at least for for past uh, past harm. Um, but the, there would, I think, be those situations in which, uh, uh, by virtue of being a common law judge, the judge is weighing these different policy considerations. Um, you know, you can think about, you know, vaccine cases and, and you know, the federal government has a, you know, uh, framework for how those cases proceed. Um, now you could get a, a state case and the judge would be considering those same policy considerations and might come up with a, a very different result. Um, and, and there's, you know, I think that Justice Thomas makes some compelling arguments that a legislative body might be better able to balance those competing policy concerns. Um, but um, I do agree that ultimately you don't have the same separation of powers concerns um, at the state level, um, at least in most states. Um, so that does seem to be more of a judicial prerogative. I want to ask uh, next about, so let's raise it to the federal level. Um, you know, of course, the, the clash here is the federalism and separation of powers on one hand, and probably a, a robust guarantee of constitutional rights on the other. So imagining for those of us, you know, those in the audience who are a conservative or libertarian minded person, you would imagine that this person believes firmly in both of those things, believes in limited government, believes in strict separation of powers, and believes in a robust guarantee of constitutional rights. And so one day, a federal agent walks into your home and steals your laptop without a warrant or something like this. And you're rightly outraged, you go to sue, and it doesn't work out the way you wanted it to um, in federal court because there's per perhaps no um, prescribed right of action there. Now, I may have the facts on that wrong, but assuming a situation somewhat um, like this, how would a conservative or libertarian minded person walk through the clash between how to maintain separation of powers and a robust guarantee of constitutional rights? Um, so, uh, it, basically, the separation of power, it, it, th that whole idea of policy is really a tough one, right? And that's kind of where um, uh, qualified immunity is problematic, for example. It, 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 it's very much the prerogative of the legislature to do policy, uh, and it's very much the prerogative of the courts to do law. So, uh, you know, just a story in the Apollon has this famous quote where he orders uh, damages against this federal official. Uh, he says, you know, the, the, the legislature might very well choose to indemnify the guy and they're free to do that. But what I am going to do is what I'm supposed to do as a judge. I'm gonna look at whether the law was violated and order a remedy uh, if it was violated. So uh, in this context of separation of powers, as well as preserving individual liberties, um, you know, courts should be uh, the ones determining whether law was violated and ordering uh, that uh, remedy if it if it wasn't. Um, 
the Supreme Court is actually, um, you know, itself doing policy, for example, in the qualified immunity jurisprudence, when it's saying, you know, qualified immunity is balancing two evils, right? On the one hand, uh, we uh, don't want the evil of the uh, law enforcement official to be deterred from fully exercising his duty because he's afraid of litigation. On the other hand, we want to ensure we, 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 we have to balance the evil of the individual rights being violated. But if you are talking about what's consistent with the separation of powers, you know, uh, the court doesn't need to be doing this uh, balancing of policy uh, concerns. It should just be looking at whether the right was violated and ordering a remedy. That's consistent uh, with both. Uh, this belief in individual rights and the belief in separation of powers. Erin, you muted. Oh. oh, can you hear me now? Yep. We gotcha. Great, great. So I think I quibble a little bit with that last part. It does seem like, um, you know, for obvious reasons, um, the remedy matters. Um, and because the remedy matters, I don't think it's entirely correct to say that what courts do are simply determining whether a right violation has occurred and then fashioning a remedy. I think that second part is doing a lot of action. Um, and I think that that is not the typical role that you see from the federal courts. When you're thinking about legislation, um, you would expect both that Congress says you know, it is um, a violation of, you know, the Affordable Care Act or, or whatnot for an employer to do X. Um, you would also expect Congress to say, and for that violation, you know, maybe it's a $5,000 penalty, uh, maybe you know, if it occurs again, the penalty doubles, those sorts of things. So, so I think it's not as easy as saying courts look to see whether rights were violated and then give a remedy. Um, that, that may be true in the, the common law setting, but I think with our separation of powers principles, we do expect that second question, you know, what is the appropriate remedy, um, to also be one that is subject to democratic debate and to the legislative process. I uh, agree with it to the extent that uh, we are carving out the Bill of Rights provision that's out of it, you know? <laughs> so when we're talking about First Amendment, Second Amendment, you know, Fourth mm -hmm. Amendment, then it's, I think it's it's a much simpler remedial process than what you're talking about, which I 100% agree that it's much more complicated. Is there any way to make these rights express as opposed to implied? Is that a... They are express. <laughs> <laughs> The remedies aren't that. <laughs> so this is this Anya, tell tell us more. No, so th there is actually an um, interesting uh, term called self-execution, whether the provision is self-executing or not and what it means, right? And if you look through the state court decisions, for example, MAC decision from Nevada uh, engages in a very elaborate discussion of, uh, you know, what it is for a provision to be self-executing and to actually have a remedy in it. So it says that when I when the Constitution says, you know, um, uh, the government shall not unreasonably seize or search you, there is this prohibition baked in it, you know, um, where or like the right shall not be infringed, right? There is this prohibition built into it, that already means a remedy inside it. However, if the language is more like advisory or talking about much broader concepts, then the MAC court in Nevada says we would be much more skeptical. The most, like the easiest example of a self-executing provision is the takings clause, right? Where there, they're specifically talking about the compensation. The question is whether you need that kind of explicit language in other constitutional provisions. And consensus among state courts is that you don't, that self-executing language is much broader than a specific like legislature, uh, that it is the court that shall be able to determine this. Uh, it, it's just as, you know, um, right shall not be infringed means that you should be able to sue and get a remedy for your rights. So that's why uh, I say that there already is a remedy in provisions of the Bill of Rights that guarantee the right to bear arms, the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Those are already the rights of action 
are baked in there. Um, and if you want to unbake them, then the provision needs to specifically say that, you know, not the other way around. But 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 again, um, the Fourth Amendment <laughs> does bake it in, um, and, and the other amendments do not. So. <laughs> Okay, well, let's see. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, Anya, I, one of the things that you've been talking about quite a bit is, is the idea that where there is a right, there must be a remedy. So I, I think this is probably an outgrowth of the last question, but if, are, there, are there provisions, perhaps constitutional provisions that you think are uh, clearer than others? You mentioned, you know, the Second Amendment shall not be infringed. Um, is this something, you know, how, how do we get the remedy out of, how do we pull the remedy out of constitutional rights, Bill of Rights guarantees, um, where there's some, some sort of debate here? Yeah, it goes back to this idea of law versus an adv advisory statement, right? So if it is, you know, law, then there needs to be some sort of enforcement attached to it, because if there isn't an enforcement attached to it, then it's nothing other than, you know, uh, in Judge Ho's uh, words, parchment promise, right? So um, uh, if, you know, we... But, but, but uh, there are interesting discussions about it. For example, uh, you know, Judge McConnell, now Professor McConnell, he talks about like when we talk about First Amendment, right? And it says Congress shall pass no law, right? What does that mean? Does it, it's, is it about Congress passing a law or are we talking about individual officials violating individual rights and then you have a remedy? Like the, 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 there are definitely uh, debates to be, had on like this more concentrated uh, level, but I think we can never forget like the big idea of um, parchment promise, uh, you know, advisory statement versus constitutional guarantees, right? Constitutional laws, because those really need to have teeth attached to them. Otherwise, um, Otherwise, what's the point of even having them there? Right. Aaron? Yeah, so I think I cut out for a little bit there, but it seems to me when you go back to the question presented in Bivens, you know, does the federal court have the ability to create a private right of action? And we're not just talking, I think, um, about a remedy. We're talking about whether someone, a private individual, can come into court and sue a federal official. Um, so that, uh, as a whole, is a sort of proposition. Of course, we have uh, sovereign immunity, and the government uh, waives that. Um, but, but we're not just talking about a remedy. We're, we're talking about a, an express private right of action um, to come into federal court to raise a constitutional issue and then for the judiciary to craft a remedy. Um, so it seems like when we're talking about this separation of powers sort of province and, and the constitution um, is certainly unique. I think the same arguments apply. Um, but but I agree with Anya that 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 it's 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 unique. When we're talking about legislation, I think I think it's crystal clear. Uh, if you have a statute that says this is a right, then we expect Congress to also say, and this is the remedy. We don't expect federal courts to be able to craft their own remedy. Um, for my part, I think the same thing really applies in the constitutional context as well. Because I would prefer um, that under our separation of powers principles, uh, we've got the legislature that's coming in cra and crafting those remedies, um, Section 1983, the Westfall Act, other things, uh, rather than um, having uh, the federal courts uh, come in and say, not only can you sue, not only do you have a private Well, um, Almost. but I, 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 yeah, I, we get, well, so we have about a minute left on it. What are your, what are your parting thoughts? Uh, so, 
Uh, to be, basically, um, I want to end on like a note of agreement, really, uh, because Erin was talking about federal courts and how federal uh, courts power is very limited. Um, the problem with federal officials accountability today is that Congress took away the power to be able to go to state courts to the common law courts and sue there for violations of individual rights. So if we are all so concerned with the limited nature of federal courts, then let's give uh, people an ability again to go to common law courts, to state courts, and sue federal officials there. Uh, we, we we're in agreement that you know when uh, state and local officials violate people's rights, and you go to state courts, then uh, state courts pretty much can't fashion remedies, right? We're in agreement on that. Um, Erin and I both think that's 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 right. So. Um, uh, now that one last piece is federal officials, uh, it can't be that, you know, uh, federal courts are have a limited power and you can't sue federal officials in federal courts, but you also can't go back to state courts. So it is important then in that case to make sure that people again can go back to state courts and sue federal officials in state courts for violation of constitutional rights. That's the parting thought. Common law courts are much stronger and much stronger footing than federal courts. So we should be able to sue federal officials in common law courts. A strong way to close it out. And I really <laughs> appreciate your time today, Anya. And of course we appreciate Aaron's time as well. And on behalf of the Federal Society, I also want to thank you for the benefit of your time and expertise today. A wonderful conversation about state and federal courts. Thank you also to our audience for joining us today. We greatly appreciate your participation. Please check out our website, fedsoc.org, or you can follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you all once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned.